singer. Bob studied illustration at the Art Center and started out as a background painter for a series of science films Seamus Colhane made, as well as Bugs Bunny cartoons for Warner Brothers, including those with Marvin Martian, and a classic from 1959, The Mouse That Jack Built, which he told me was one of his favorites he ever worked on. After doing layout work, freelancing, and at UPA, where he did Mr. Magoo, um, Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, and Gay Paris, um, a lot of fan favorite, yeah, um, and all sorts of other um, freelance projects. He landed at Hanna-Barbera, where he spent many happy years and created and ran the Hanna-Barbera character design department and designed lots of characters that we all know and love. My name Willie Ito. Seeing Snow White is what inspired Willie to become an animator. How great that one of his first jobs was as an in-betweener for the spaghetti scene of Lady and the Tramp. I know, right? <laughs> and he's worked with just about everybody. At Warner Brothers, he spent time at the famed Termite Terrace and was um, six years on Chuck Jones' unit, where he assisted on One Froggy Evening and What's Opera Doc and a lot of other classics for a total of six years with that studio. He also worked with Bob Clampett um, on Beanie and Cecil and then moved to Hanna-Barbera where he worked on layouts and character design for 14 years. Art Leonardi. Um, Art started out at MGM. He painted sets for Singing in the Rain and the ceiling that Fred Astaire danced on in um, Royal Wedding and the pool Esther Williams swam in in Million Dollar Mermaid. Still, we wanted to animate. So through determination and talent, he wound up at Warner Brothers and worked on a lot of classic cartoons at, um, in both the McKinson and Freeling units. And he went on to work at the Patty Freeling and direct a number of great Pink Panther shorts. And he's won a bunch of awards, including an Emmy, an Annie, an Ace, and he just got the June Fourier Award last year. Yay. Yay. Um, Raj Baran. Iraj formed the art department at Hanna-Barbera in 1971, and his art approval maintained the integrity of hundreds of Hanna-Barbera cartoons. He presented art for pitching new shows, which if you know Hanna-Barbera must have been an interesting task. He was involved in producing over 4,000 products using their characters for licensees, and designed tons of publicity art. He also started the art cell division and helped create art that many of my clients bought. Um, so thanks. <laughs> and he designed the Laugh Room at the UCLA Medical Center's Pediatric Board and got a special award from the City of LA for the Yogi's Earthquake Preparedness Program. And he won an Emmy uh, for the Adams Family in 1994. Okay, so we're going to ask each of them a few questions and then um, they'll talk a little bit about, because they actually did at one point all work together, um, and then we'll have a few questions from you guys. Um, so Bob, you worked on some great cartoons, like The Mouse That Jack Built and Gay Paris and uh, Johnny Quest and Scooby-Doo. What are some of the favorite characters or cartoons you worked on? Oh, I think Far and Away must have been Scooby-Doo. Yeah, yeah. That was a great service. It was designed in 68 and released in 69 and ran for out of how many years. It's still running, I think, all over the world. But uh, I was part of the presentation crew that put it together, although it, the characters were, were designed by a man named Iwo Takamoto. And my part was running the layouts on the show, and I laid out the first Scooby, and um, then I took over the character design department on that, uh, on that show. But anyway, I designed many of the uh, ghosts and bad guys on Scooby. The Tom Monster, the Electric Monster. <laughs> Electric Monster, we didn't know what to do with him as far as his design. <clears throat> so I went out to an electrical company in Burbank and I looked at all the different uh, devices they had. And it still didn't look like it could become a character. So we went back and I just designed an outline of a, of a, a monster, but we did it in ink and paint. We uh, uh, shot it on one so, and uh, put uh, uh, paint on the front of the cell so it made it flicker. So all we have is just a moving washer, but it flickered just like electricity. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, that brings me to asking uh, about, um, as the character design department, which you started, um, do you have a couple of examples of problem solving like that one, or characters that you developed that you found in particularly interesting? Well, you might find it interesting that in, in the early days of animation, in the 20s and 30s, most of the animators designed their own characters. And neither in Hanna-Barbera, we, uh, the layout men would be asked to design their own incidental, like the cop, the housewife, uh, things like that, <coughs> props, cars. But um, they got so busy that it was, became a burden on the uh, layout men. So I suggested that we start a character design department. And I started with myself and one other person. And soon we had 15 artists. Uh, doing like seven different shows, all the characters, making model sheets, <clears throat> and it helped the studio run more efficiently that way. And so what was the process with the character um, design? At what point did you did them first and after the script was brought to you, or how did that work? <clears throat> well, we would, um, everything was compressed as far as uh, production, so sometimes we had to work from uh, a script. And other times, we would rather prefer to work from a storyboard. But maybe a storyboard man didn't know what to use for his character. So oftentimes, we'd do a quick sketch and give it to the storyboard man to make a sketch for his storyboard. And then uh, we also had to have approval by the producer. So sometimes I would design three or four or five different uh, versions of the same character and show it to the producer i say, which one do you like? And he would pick one, and then that's the one I would completely draw and do turnarounds on and make model sheets. Was there a particular character that you felt like should have gone in a different direction that was really different than the way that they, what they chose? You had to bring up that story. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Winters uh, did the voice for, a, he was a guest star on the Scooby-Doo. And you know, Winters had this alter ego of, a, of an old lady. Remember that? Yeah. Mod Frickett. <laughs> anyway, I designed a, an old lady uh, for Mod Frickett. And uh, after it was put into production, uh, someone told me, hey, Bob, that should look like the uh, Jonathan Winters face. You know, after all, it was him doing the character in his uh, comedy. And so we thought it was a big mistake. And we, it was too late to fix it. We went through with just an old lady's face. For <laughs> long but years later, I watched the cartoon and I decided, no, I did the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been wrong to have a Jonathan Winters caricature, which it was, and then also Mark Pickett looked like him. It would have been wrong. But anyway, I guess too wrong to make it right. <laughs> Willie, um, some of your earliest work was as an in-betweener for Lee and the Tramp. How um, did being at Disney inform the rest of your career? Well, first of all, Disney's training was quite intense. And of all the persons to be my mentor was Iwo Takamoto. <laughs> he was so precise. Lit picking, <laughs> and I, as I would stand behind him as he would correct my drawings, I used to think, hmm, maybe my dad was right. He thought I should go to barber school. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, I I survived that uh, ordeal. Um, after Lady in the Tramp was completed, I went on to uh, Warner Brothers, and uh, I started working with Chuck Jones. And when Disney called me back for Sleeping Beauty, I, uh, I had to refuse the offer, figuring once you refuse Disney, they'll never invite you back. <laughs> Though I ended my career 23 years at Disney Studios. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about your time at Termite Terrace and then at Hanna-Barbera, some of the things that you did? Yeah, we, um, we got word at Disney that it was our last day, and so I got on the phone and I called Johnny Burton, who was production manager, and I told him I just got trained at Disney, 
So if you have a job for me, he says, oh, come on down. So that Monday morning, I reported to the infamous Termite Terrace. And I kid you not, it was really a dump. <laughs> when I walked in and sat at a desk that the old black and white Bosco cartoons were animated on, and the hardwood floors were all slivered, no central air conditioning. No. And the light was one of those old gooseneck lamps with light bulbs. And underneath your uh, disc was also light bulbs. Well, I just came from a state-of-the-art studio, Walt Disney. So it, it took a little bit of uh, adjustment, but you know, it was surprising that these great cartoons by Chuck and Frizz and Tex Avery and Bob Clampett and Frank Tishman came out of such a dump. <laughs> well, I have to mention, on the very last day at Termite Terrace, we had a big time. And one of the objectives with everyone was to trash the studio. <laughs> and so, one of the things that we did, which when you think about it now, will make you cringe. We went to the storage area and got stacks of cells. All the Bugs Bunny and all the cats. And From the 50s. Apart, and we threw it across the splintered floor. And with the running start, we skidded across the floor, leaving a trail of colorful paint. Can you imagine? No, I'm trying not to. Uh, so, what made you want to be a layout artist? Well, uh, Chuck. Chuck was very good with us. We, I, I was Ken Harris's assistant, and Ken was an animator that was known for doing great dance scenes. So I assisted Ken on all of these great things like the Jay Michigan Frog singing, Hello, my baby, <laughs> and singing. And I worked on all of those, and then of course, Gil, the Wad, Gil, the all that. Uh, What's up, Doc? And, uh, it, it, it was really wonderful, but I always sort of uh, wanted to do a little more designing. They threw me a bone once in a while where I could design the incidental characters in one of Chuck's uh, shorts. And uh, what happened is um, Chris Freeling was looking to train a new layout man, and Holly Pratt, uh, his layout man, took me under his wings, so Chuck literally loaned me to Chris Green for six weeks for that one car film. During that period, Bob Clampett was starting up his Beanie and Cecil show, and Bob called and offered me a job to come down and uh, head up his layout department until he got a crew. So, I went to Chuck and Fred and said, well, I got an offer I can't refuse, so I'm going to be leaving. Uh, and Chuck said, oh, you'll be sorry. Because studios like Bob Clampett making shows for television fly by night. <laughs> We're going to be around forever. <laughs> That's all, folks. <laughs> um, so, Art? Um, can you talk a little bit about your early days working um, on the McKinson and Bruce Freeling units at Warner Brothers? He was a great, great, great friend of mine. In fact, when I, like she mentioned, I worked at MGM on sets for Singing in the Rain and all that stuff. And I actually saw him dancing in the rain. Back a lot. Anyway, I went from there and I went to uh, Dell Publishing and I got into comic books. And start working there in the bullpen. Another like four or five of us. And our job was um, the freelance artists would send mail there in large comic pages to us. And to save time, there was a Tom McKibson, Bob's brother, who was in charge of that, and Chuck, Chuck McKibson. 
they would say, well, panel seven on page two is not right. One of you fix it. And we go through all this uh, freelance artist work and change panels. So we've got great experience working on different styles. So because we had to look at this style and then draw that panel and make it fit. So we didn't annoy the freelance artists and send them all the work back. And when I was in the bullpen, I got three raises at that time. I was always complaining. I never, I never, I never. So they gave me raises. I find out that the girl that sent the mail around made more than us. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see how low the salary was at that time. Working there, Chuck McKinson came to me and says, um, my brother's looking for a bowler. I said, well, I bowl. He goes, well, do you want to do bowl on this team? Bob McKinson. He was the director of Warner Brothers. So I got on this team and, uh, and bowled with him. And I had to always sketch on paper. And after a while, he said, hey, I like the cartoons you're doing. He says, you want to work for me? And so that's how I got into animation. <laughs> so anyone who aspires to get in the business, there's all kinds of ways to break in. <laughs> so that's how I got into Warner Brothers uh, and went up the run just like they did. Uh, in between, assistant animator, animator, director, and we had to go through the whole process. And of course I was always anxious to get to the next level. And so uh, one or two of the other fellows, uh, one specific, I pushed to get to be assistant animator. As soon as I did that, the first would say, okay, you can be an assistant animator. And I, the other guy said, how come he got to be an assistant? I want to be an assistant. <laughs> so all through my career, this guy was following me. <laughs> if I made an animator, he goes, you made an animator. I want to be an animator. So, all right, you can animate. So that's how that went. <laughs> Um, can you talk about um, what it, in your Warner Brothers days helped you in directing and working on Pink Panther? Well, it's kind of like osmosis. It just happens. I mean, all through my career, I'm going, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough. And all of a sudden, after being through all this, I can now time things and do elements in animation automatically. It's ingrained in the system. So that's how that works. You don't just automatically have to step where you become a director. It just evolves into it. Uh, and Raj, um, you were um, in charge of Hanna Barbera's art department for 30 years. Can you talk about some of your favorite projects during that time? First, I, I apologize for not wearing my Hanna Barbera. You're on the train. And these three gentlemen. Brandon, Brandon. I have the pleasure, privilege of working with them. And we're wearing, well, this and he's showing off his academy, the right academy. Yeah. Here's Willie, a Disney guy, and of course, uh, Bob, where is your hat? I'm getting it, I'm getting it. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell they work together. <laughs> So we kicked it around, he would come to the studio, 
first team to go to, he will talk to Mojo and then to the top of this group, keep it around. So we came up with actually he did. He said, let's put the word fun there. So that logo, the tag for Hanover here on the top became a fantastic Hanover there. The word of the Hanover there. So back to your original question. <laughs> uh, part of my job as an art director at Hanover Bureau uh, was uh, teaching, making these boards uh, that these gentlemen helped on as far as characters are concerned. I had the largest uh, room that was next to the camera department. Uh, it has, uh, I had a very large light table that uh, permitted everybody to gather in my office and do their things. Uh, you know, at that time, the gluing was rubber cement. <laughs> we don't have that anymore. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Jerry Eisenberg, Willie and everybody, are Bob would be drawing and I would be inking, maybe doing the lettering. And here's this is late at night. Uh, Joe Barbera would be walking in with his tie, uh, jacket, and so on, uh, waiting for to see what uh, what we're doing. Is it done? Because he was about to leave the following morning to take these boards to uh, to the New York to pitch. So that was really fun. It was. Uh, <laughs> um, it was really fun working on these uh, uh, boards that uh, was really the core of uh, Hanover era it, that, that came from that room. <laughs> With uh, that period, uh, the production uh, had ceased. The, all the, uh, the shows had already there. This would be around uh, Christmas time, actually. <laughs> but the bunch of us would be still working a group of uh, that guy was under the direction of, of course, you were talking about them. And uh, we would be busy in this room doing, uh, making these boards to take uh, to uh, New York by Joe Barbera. When he would walk in, it was really fantastic. <laughs> he was, uh, he was so funny and he would make, it, he would make jokes. <laughs> And uh, that was really fantastic. Do you have some um, examples? You were talking about pitching art for new shows. Um, a few shows that didn't make it that you worked on or that you had to pitch uh, that you were really proud of ultimately being turned into a show? Yes, there were quite a few of them. Uh, the name would change, the characters would change, and uh, Willie can tell you more about, for instance, Hong Kong Pui was never that look. Uh, he designed it finally. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, the was <laughs> the, 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 yeah, shows like uh, I recall the Moon Family, for instance. I don't know if you guys remember. And I had to make, uh, apart from these huge uh, presentation boards, that uh, these were crescent boards that we would cut in half, it would be 20 inches. Uh, but uh, the script covers were required to uh, put the scripts with the, these big boards to pitch. And I remember working on this show that I just mentioned. It never took. Uh, another one, there was a good one uh, that was called uh, Duffy's Dozen. Uh, that never took. It was uh, a family. Uh, do you remember Bob? Duffy's Desert? Yeah. Yeah, and we, we had to, uh, these were, uh, I remember the boards now, because <laughs> uh, these were photographs of uh, sites in the United States, uh, including Yosemite, uh, Rushmore, and many uh, famous places uh, uh, in America. These were uh, secrets blown up with the characters, cartoon characters. This was a family. Uh, they had Duffy's Dozen, it was called, because they, are, they were 12 children. Nice. Yeah. 
-hmm. What about ones that actually took that you were surprised or you had to work really hard to get them to accept? Say Scooby Doo, you know, we didn't think uh, Scooby would take off. Uh, in 1969, it was one of those uh, other shows, uh, and uh, the rest is history. Did it seem like you were doing really interesting, groundbreaking stuff, any of you guys, about Scooby Doo? Um, before I answer that, I'd like to, uh, I forgot it's an artist's name. Right. His name is Alex Toth. Alex, when I uh, was asked to take over the Fantastic Four layouts, <clears throat> Alex had just quit. He had some difference with Joe Rivera. So I took him out to lunch and I begged him to stay, which is a very good thing he did. Because thereafter, each week, he would come in with, I don't know how many model sheets for each show. Week after week, he did all the sheets. Spaceships, the bad guys, uh, the good guys, all the incidental characters on a Fantastic Four. I mean, it was an amazing thing he did for us. And he did it for the whole season. So I can't say enough about the talent of this man, Alex How about we talk about the working with Mel Blanc? There were a lot of um, voice people, that, but we never saw them, except one day. Uh, John from Winters, which I mentioned before, visited the studio, and at break time, the whole department left and it was empty. And I wondered where they were, so I went out the back of the building, and there everyone was crowded around John from Winters, who was getting his comedic spiel. <laughs> he was just entertaining everybody. Uh, what a wonderful man to do that. All right, you were telling about um, Mel and his Bugs Bunny voice. Oh, Bugs Bunny. Oh, here it is. Uh, yeah, Mel Blanc. A lot of times I would sneak back and watch the vocal uh, people do their voices and things. And Mel Blanc was for Bugs Bunny. So he'd have to get with the mic and he'd actually take a carrot. Like that. And say, hey, what's up, Doc? And then he spit in the bucket. <laughs> he, he said, I hate the carrots. <laughs> and so they said, all right, but you got to chew a carrot. You go, all right, you put in a bucket. And so that's what he would do. You guys all worked together at one point. What, what year was that? In the early 70s? <laughs> <laughs> Various studios got the contract, and Warner Brothers happened to get one of the contracts, and Chuck was assigned to oversee the animation portion of it. So uh, Chuck Jones, Big Bob, myself, and Lou Shimer, who later formed Filmation production. So the three of us worked together uh, away from the main studio, right near the front gate of Warner Brothers Studio. And artists generally can't just sit there and just draw, draw, draw for eight, ten hours. You have to get up and stretch. And I did a lot of stretching as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> so I was at the Venetian blind looking out the window. The Miss Universe contest was being held in Los Angeles. And I, I looked over at the uh, front the entry and saw these bevies of beauties all lined up. And I said, hey, 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 Bob, hey, Lou, Lou, come over, take a look. Bob was very serious. <laughs> he just sat there, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> but Lou hopped up, he, he's about a foot taller than me, and he was hovering above me, and we should Chuck Jones sneaks into the uh, room, 
goes to the Venetian blind and goes, Frah! <laughs> <laughs> that comes for this nose. <laughs> and, but we, we have a lot of hijinks. Uh, you, you need to you know, let off the amount of steam. And, and that science series was you know, a lot of pressure because uh, uh, Owen Crump, who was a big time director at Warner Brothers Studios, uh, live action and all that, they were all involved, and suddenly I realized, oh my gosh, we're working with all these big time Warner Brother uh, directors and producers. So, so that was interesting. Part. And then, of course, uh, working with him on the cartoons. And, and he, he was always a prolific photographer. So we always figured that uh, if you needed a historical record of the animation of the golden age, art would have every brief frame of it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the other part of was a place there, um, they did a lot really fast. One of the things I, I heard from all of you guys at some point is how in your careers, every time you moved to a new studio, you were asked to do things faster. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like to work when you were at Hanna Rivera, the number of different uh, projects you were working on at the same time and how they worked um, in terms of the character design and layouts and all of that? Well, when I was at UPA, I, they closed the doors on me, so I went to Hanna Barbera, but I had heard that they were a sweatshop. <laughs> that they, everybody worked their butt off. And uh, <clears throat> when I got there, I discovered I loved it. <laughs> this, the, there was a hustle bustle going on with Johnny Quest at that time. You know, many, many artists were working quietly in their, in their cubicles, but I just took to that pace. Just about it. And uh, we had a um, we have to do at least six hours a day, but I always, I always try to do more like 13 a day. But the, the fastest lab man I ever met was Mo Gala, that we mentioned before. He would do 100 scenes a week, a playhouse, a 20 a day, and an eight hour day. Are you working on a bunch of different shows at the same time, or how's that work? There's something else. Uh, you know, all of us, all of us were gypsies in those days. We'd go from studio to studio, and we always had to adapt to the style of that studio. So, um, when you have several different shows, it's important that all of them look different, uh, with different styles. So, um, we got very used to that, to reading a model sheet or looking at a background design and imitating it, designing in that area. That was a challenge for all of us. Ramesh, can you talk a little bit about when you were working on Super Friends? Because I know that's a big fan favorite. Super Friends. Uh, it was uh, another show by Hanna Barbera. They had like Scooby Doo and Fink once. And the, my duty to do the titles, I had the privilege of uh, using Alex Stoll's <laughs> to do the characters. And that was fun to see him. Uh, with the drawings, and then uh, I would be asking him, Alex, I would like the symmetrical design. Symmetrical design, okay. I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he would do a terrific uh, layout uh, and would ink it too. But it was not quite ready for, it wasn't sharp enough for uh, ink and paint. So I would go to that one there, but I've seen it, to clean it up, and I would end up inking it myself, and that would be part of the title card, as well as the other elements that would go with it. It was fun. Uh, uh, recording of it, you mentioned earlier, was fun, because uh, Studio A downstairs, I don't know where they are, uh, when the red would be flashing, that means doing some recording and that day was Super Friends recording and I would sneak in there to, to watch uh, what the worst people do. Uh, that was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>
did you guys have a sense of um, any of you um, of the strength of the of the fans and the enthusiasm of the fans while you were working on the cartoons themselves, or is it only later? No, we had no idea that all of you were out there watching these cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> we were just drawing and earning our pay. But uh, years later, when I retired, I began to travel around uh, doing uh, personal appearances, and I discovered this huge group of wonderful um, artists and fans of our, what we did. And they kept saying things like, you made my childhood so happy, and, and uh, they're almost crying some of them. But I had to tell them, look, I'm only one guy, and there's hundreds of us working. And we really, there was a wall between ourselves and the fans out there. We just didn't realize you loved our work so much. We were so happy you did. Personally, we would complete a cartoon, turn it in, get our day check, and totally forget about it. <laughs> so all these years later, when people would come up and say, hey, we loved the, what you did on this show or that show, I have no recollection. <laughs> so my grandkids watch Boomerang. And they say, oh, Grandpa, we saw your name on, you know, uh, whatever it was. See, I can't even remember. <laughs> It, it surprises me and, and really amazes me what I worked on and, and uh, had no idea that I did anything. Just, just last week I met with a friend of mine uh, who worked with Bob Singer and he lived in my neighborhood. I was now at Disney's but I was doing some moonlighting. This fella Davis, Davis Stoy, as a matter of fact, he produced and directed a lot of the Scooby-Doo cartoons that went direct to video. But he used to get the assignment that Bob wanted me to handle. Bring it over to my house, maybe 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, whenever he got uh, home, and handed me the assignment. Then I work in, in the evening. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, he'd come by and I handed over to him. And then I was doing all this uh, uh, incidental characters for a number of shows. But to this day, I don't remember what shows they were. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he mentioned, well, that was Richie Rich. I said, oh, I don't know why I worked on Richie Rich. <laughs> but that's how much work you were cranking out, right. where you could remember one from the other. Like he's the hero, really. I worked with you over five years, and I worked for, for ten years. Uh, but for 33 even the studios <laughs> didn't think we were. We were on the back line of Warner Brothers, and we were the poor relations live action was the thing. We were just nothing. And so, in a way, it was good because Bob McKimson, Chuck Jones, and Chris Freeling had free reign to make great classic cartoons without any... Messing around. ...office nuts stick their nose in the business. And so they created, with this great storyboard, I mean writers, Mike Maltese, John Dunn, who was the other one? Uh, Bob Ogle. Bob Ogle. And Warren Foster. Warren Foster. They, they were the greatest writers. In fact, Mike Maltese, I went by his room one day, and he was sleeping on a cot. And I said, wait a minute. I'm working my butt off, and if I close my eyes, they're going to yell at me or fire me. He says, ah, but I'm, I'm a writer. <laughs> I am laying down thinking. <laughs> the other part of the story about one is not liking cartoons and downgrading. They sold all the cartoons to a company. They didn't want to get involved with TV. So what they did was sold it. Oh, wait, let's get rid of this stuff. We'll make a few bucks on this. They sold it. A while later, the group put it on TV and they made so much money they bought Warner Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> they bought the whole. <laughs> and it became.
working seven arts. And it took them years to work and work to get back the rights to all those cartoons. Does anybody have any questions?
is a long sheet and it's got each line is a frame of film. Okay? And so each exposure sheet is about six what is it, uh, six feet of animation. And we would time it on the sheet, the action. There would be one line would say DIA dialogue. We'd have a man come in and we'd listen to the track and he would put down hello. How are you? In letters. The animator would get that and he would know. Hat, low, mouth it to the dialogue. That's how they would connect the dialogue. I always like to have my animation done with my hand over my <laughs>
and in the bowling alley was a lounge, and the stand-up comic, Scatman Brothers, was featured. We thought, you know, this, this is really a character that is so opposite from what you would expect Hong Kong foodie from. Uh, and, and we got friendly with uh, Scatman because we used to see him all the time. So we, we talked to him, and I think I think Joe at that time also had the same idea of going way off into left field. And, and so eventually he agreed and came in, and, and of course the, the rest is history. But during that time, there was a restaurant that we used to go to after work on the Imperial Gardens on Sunset Boulevard. And Don Jerwich was uh, directing some of the uh, Chan Clan shows. And so uh, this actor that I knew, uh, I, uh, we called him over and, and had a drink and says, hey, um, would you like to come to uh, Hanna-Barbera and audition for one of the voices? And so he says, oh, well, yeah, that would be good. And, you know, I'd like to do that. He didn't show up the next day, but the following week we saw him at the Imperial Garden. I said, "Say, hey, Pat, what happened? Uh, you didn't, uh, you know, show up." He said, "Oh, I had an audition at Warner Brothers, and he was uh, uh, the karate kid. <laughs> he got the part as the karate kid." Uh, we have time for one more question. Well, to me, of course. I was five years old when I saw Snow White, uh, big theater, in living color, and uh, on this big screen, and seven little men marched across the screen singing, I hope, I hope, and I says, that's what I want to be. N not one of the seven doors. <laughs> 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 Well, when I was a freshman in high school, I loved art, and I also loved music. And uh, when I found out I had to buy my own instrument, we couldn't afford it. That's when I said, no, way, I'll become an artist. <laughs> Can you guys talk a little bit just about what you're doing right now, or where we might be able to find you online, or if there's anything you want to talk about? Well, I've been uh, very fortunate in my retirement year. I've been retired 20 years now, but I've been very busy working, uh, doing uh, personal appearances and military editions, and uh, th that's where I met all these clients uh, when I go out on speaking engagements. Um, it's wonderful to meet all of you and, and to see how you appreciate our work. We didn't have no idea that you felt that way about our work. It's very gratifying. So that's been a big surprise to me, and, and uh, you know, I'm still doing it. Because I love doing it. And I don't know what I'd do if I didn't draw. I would be watching TV or going to the pool hall or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, after I retired from Disney, a friend of mine approached me and says he wrote a, a, a manuscript and uh, would I be interested in illustrating it? And I thought, well, yeah, well, gee, I just retired and maybe I should just sort of relax a bit. But send me the manuscript. And the manuscript, I don't know how many of you know that during World War II, the Japanese Americans were all interned, uh, those living on the West Coast, to camps, internment camps. And this story was about uh, his experience in camp. And I thought, you know, that, that phase of history is uh, sort of buried. They don't teach it in schools and all. So I decided to take on the challenge and uh, uh, I illustrated the uh, first uh, picture book called Hello Maggie. Uh, and then now uh, uh, I have a chapter book called uh, Boy of Heart Mountain. And then I'm on my third book called Kimiko. And uh, so these are all that particular subject matter. So that's what I mean. Well, right now I've just completed a, uh, an app for safety for children, fighters, and I think it's going well. And we were trying to 
do a series of those. Safety for children, where fire, drowning, hurricanes, earthquakes, and, and we're probably continuing to do that. I do I almost completed the book almost of the working barriers um, with this woman. Uh, family of doctors and dogs making a book computer. Uh, it currently I'm in the process of uh, editing my memoirs, which I started uh, many years ago with the help of a ghostwriter, the same ghostwriter who wrote the Alphanus book. Uh, it's going to be called The Great Old Time, which is taken from the Flintstones uh, music, uh, great well, we'd, like, music. we'd like to thank our panelists.